Welcome friends to the part three of the EM facts for the boards. I'm Sajad Pathan and today we are going to talk about two conditions affecting the mandible and the temporomandibular joint. Before I begin, I want to convey my thanks to those who have subscribed to my channel. For those who haven't subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button and share these videos with your friends at work. Let us begin this video with a concept which we had learned in my previous video. For those who have not seen that video, you can click over here and watch the video. A 50 year old female with painful swelling along the left lower jaw. The pain worsens while eating. Despite drinking enough water, she says she has a dry mouth. What is the best method of treatment? There are five options given here. You do an incision drainage prescribe intravenous antibiotics, prescribe oral antibiotics, prescribe some silagogues, or just give them some NSAIDs and reassurance. Take a moment of pause over here and think about the answer. If you have got the answer, you can check your answer with the previous video which I had made about the jaw swellings. Let us begin here with two conditions affecting the mandible. One condition in which the patient is unable to open the mouth and in the other, an open mouth cannot be closed. You're right. We are going to talk about mandibular fractures and TMJ dislocations. Before we head on to the clinical concepts, let us look at some clinical anatomy. Here is a picture of the mandible. The mandible is divided into two parts, one on each side. Each side the mandible has a body, an angle, ramus, a coronoid process anteriorly and the condyle posteriorly. If you look closely on the inner aspect of the ramus, there is a groove through which travels the inferior alveolar nerve and this is the nerve the dentist commonly blocks before doing any dental procedure. The nerve enters through the foramen and comes out at the body through the mental foramina and is known as mental nerve. Now let us look at mandibular fractures. Usually these patients will come with history of fall over the chin or hit from the side on the face. Normally the condyle fractures very commonly. Second is the body, third is the ankle and fourth is the symphysis of the mandibular joint. Think of the mandible as a ring shaped structure. That, what, do, what do I mean by that is if you see one fracture look for another. I'll give you an analogy over here. There are two bones in the body which form a ring shaped structure. One is the mandible as we have discussed here and the other one is your hip bone or the pelvis. If you see a fracture at one place you will see a fracture at the other. So what are the findings when you examine a patient with mandibular fracture? The patient will come with jaw pain, you might see malocclusion, the patient is unable to fully open the mouth, you may see an area of ecchymosis externally or in the oral cavity, there may be paresthesia present at the jaw, you might see a fractured missing or a loose tooth. How do you manage these conditions? You need to get a CT scan of the facial bone. However, a CT scan is not always available and then you might have to resort to other imaging technologies. You would get an orthopantomogram. How do you manage once you diagnose a fracture of the mandible? It depends on whether the fracture is undisplaced, uncomplicated fracture versus a fracture which is an open fracture or displaced fracture or there is accompanying dental trauma. If it is an undisplaced fracture, a simple analgesic prescription, soft diet advice and oral surgery follow up in one to two days can be done. However, if you are concerned about a displaced fracture or an open fracture a dental trauma, consult immediately with the maxillofacial surgeons, prescribe IV antibiotics and tetanus prophylaxis. 
In the meantime, you can immobilize the jaw with a bandage called as Barton bandage. Let me give you some pearls over here. Whenever you come across a gingival laceration or dental trauma, you need to consider it as an open fracture. And when you see chymosis within the oral cavity, below the tongue, or if you see blood in the sublingual area, that is pathognomonic of a mandibular fracture. And as I've said earlier, more than 50% of mandibular fractures are at more than one location. As it's in the oral cavity, always think that this might precipitate an airway obstruction scenario as well. Let us talk about something called as Frey's syndrome over here. So Frey's syndrome is a patient who comes in with complaints of sweating on the jaw area and flushing whenever they are eating. This is commonly due to uh, injury to the auriculotemporal nerve following a parotid surgery or a jaw injury. Let us move ahead with temporomandibular joint dislocation. There are three types of dislocation of the temporomandibular joint, anterior, posterior, superior. The patient will come with history of either they were yawning, laughing or vomiting and they can't close their open mouth. So the patient comes in with an open mouth, unable to close, a garbled speech, at times they might be drooling. The TMJ dislocation can also happen due to one of the iatrogenic procedure we commonly perform in the emergency department. While intubating, doing a laryngoscopy, and if you had exerted a lot of pressure on the jaw, it might dislocate. How do you diagnose a TMJ dislocation? I, as I said earlier, it's a clinical diagnosis based on the history that the patient is unable to close the mouth after he's been yawning and the speech will be garbled. You can feel a preauricular depression. The jaw will be open and fixed either in midline or to the unaffected side. As in any facial trauma, you would like to get a CT scan of the facial bone. And if that is not available, get an orthopantomogram. How do you reduce a TMJ dislocation? Normally, you do an intraoral approach. You put your padded gloved thumb on both the molars and push it down and back. That's the intraoral approach. The other approach is the extraoral approach by standing either in front or the back of the patient and manipulating the jaw. One of the approach just mentioned is called as a syringe method and it's quite easy to be performed. You take a 10 ml syringe and put it on the side which is dislocated and ask the patient to chew on that side and you might be able to reduce the dislocation in the emergency department. Although so many techniques have been mentioned, there is a lack of evidence towards which method is more better than the other one. The question here is, when do I refer these patients to the maxillofacial surgeons? You refer these patients to the maxillofacial surgeons if the patient had past history of two or more times of dislocation of that particular jaw. Obviously, if you have been unable to reduce the dislocation, you will refer to the maxillofacial surgeons. If the dislocation is associated with a mandible fracture, I would let the maxillofacial surgeons take over the case from me. And as I've said, the posterior and superior are very rare ones, but they are the complicated ones. If you find a posterior or a superior dislocation, refer them to the maxillofacial surgeons. Once you have successfully reduced this dislocation and the patient is being able to close his mouth and the speech has come back to normal, you're going to discharge this patient to be followed up with the maxillofacial surgeons in two to three days. In the meantime, you're going to advise the patient to apply ice locally or warm compressors. You can give them prescription of NSAIDs, ask them to maintain a soft diet for a week or two. Advise them to avoid extreme opening of the jaw for three weeks and ask them to support their jaw while yawning. 
That's all in this video. Thank you for watching through till here. Subscribe to this channel, hit the like button and share this video. I will see you soon with my next video on facial trauma. Until then, peace.